substance abuse ministry involves releasing people from their, or helping people to become free from their uh, addictions to uh, alcohol, tobacco, and illegal drugs. And also prescription drugs. Some people use prescription drugs for recreational purposes. But whichever substance they are abusing, Today, in this class, one class period, I want to talk about one thing that may help you to help the young people to get free from this. And this is what you do. You help the young people by making fun of the practice of drinking, smoking, mainlining, so that they think that's awful, you know. There was a drunkard. One way to do it is to tell jokes about drunkenness, or jokes about smoking, or jokes about drug use, so that people laugh at it, and they say, I don't want to do that, and they'll stay away from it. Because drunks can make themselves look very foolish. For example, this drunkard is walking home, and he has one foot on the sidewalk, and one foot on the street, and he's walking, you know, and the policeman who is doing his beat, you know, the policeman, he sees him, he says to the drunkard, hey, why are you walking with one foot on the street and one foot on the sidewalk? And the drunkard looks down and he sees his feet like this. And he says, oh, I'm so happy you told me. I thought I was crippled. <laughs> and another drunkard was walking down the street and the street lights are there, you know. And he will stagger along and, and when he comes to the street light, he will run out into the street to avoid hitting the street light. So he's going the sidewalk and he goes out into the street and then he goes back and he goes up. And the, uh, the, poli the, the policeman says, you are not fit for the public thing, you go home. And he said, why are you blaming me? The street lights, they keep running at me, but I always get out of the way. It's not my fault. <laughs> And then another time, the one drunkard, he had his house key, and he was trying to put the key in the streetlight post. <laughs> and uh, the local policeman, he says, you better give up, there's nobody home. <laughs> and uh, and he, says, he says, that's where you are wrong. He says, there's a light on upstairs. <laughs> the, the light is left on upstairs and somebody is home. So. So that's uh, different things drunkards do. And uh, there was one drunk guy who used to come home drunk every night. Every night he comes home drunk. He goes from his duty, he goes straight to the bar, and he drinks and drinks and drinks. And he doesn't eat dinner at home. And he comes home late, and his wife is already asleep. And he comes to the front door, and he would stagger and put the <laughs> and he would vomit into the sink, sink, kitchen sink. This was his practice every day. So he used to do this. So one, his wife told him, if you don't be careful, one day you are going to vomit your whole insides out. <laughs> and he said, no, that's impossible. That will never happen. Well, this day, was Christmas feast or something. She was cooking a special meal. She had killed the chicken. And she had, but she had a job, you see, because he was not working a good job because his life was being wasted on drunkenness. And so she had to work to her own job. And she was very tired. She came home from her duty and she was trying to cook this chicken and kill the chicken, clean the chicken, everything. And she had cut open the chicken. She had taken the feathers off, and she had uh, cut open the chicken, and she had removed all the all the all the guts, you know, in the wash basin. And then her exhaustion, her tiredness, just came over, and she said, "I can't do anymore. I have to go. To, I have to go lie down." So she went to the bedroom. She took the meat she put in the fridge, but she forgot this. It was still there. She was just tired. She went. And that night he came in as usual, you know. Bah! 
45 minutes later, he's waking his wife up. Honey, he's, she's asleep. What? What? He said, remember you told me that one day if I keep drinking, one day I will come home and I will vomit my upside into the, into the kitchen sink. And she's sleeping. She said, yes. He said, it happened. And she said, what? He said, don't worry. He said, by the help of God and the kitchen, long wooden kitchen spoon, I got them all back down again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that means all that stuff he ate because he thought it was his own, you know, so he put it back inside in his drunkenness. <laughs> oh, anyway. Then uh, this is to start, show you see the foolishness of drinking, and then there the story that uh, in the mountains of eastern USA there was a boxer who he, his boxing career was not going very well. He wasn't getting much, so he turned to drink, and his drink made his boxing career worse. So he was no good as a boxer anymore. So he was just the town drunk. And this very steep mountainside area. And the churches are small churches sitting on the mountainside. So this one pastor was having his church meeting, small congregation there, church, and everybody crowded together in the church building. And the drunk came, and he, uh, he came into the church and oh, praise the Lord, Allah, yeah, and everything. So finally he was causing so much disturbance, they told him to go, and he would not go. So they picked him up bodily and they passed him over the heads of the people. Everybody is so close together. They just passed him over the heads of the people and the door is open there and they just threw him out through the front the door outside. And the, the church is right on the edge of the mountainside. He just rolled it and finally came to a stop. And he was shaking his head. Then he was trying, they closed the door, they closed the windows, they put the shutters. He tried to keep his noise outside. And the pastor is having service and he's going out, he's banging on the shutters and, and shouting, let me inside! So then the, finally the pastor said, it's no use. So the pastor, he walked down the center aisle and his congregation followed him outside. And he took his coat off and he handed it to somebody. And he said to the drunkard, he said, I know what you are asking for, and I'm going to give it to you. He began to roll his shirt sleeves up. Now, this pastor, before he was converted and came to the Lord, he was also a boxer. <laughs> <laughs> and these two guys had had a match many years ago. And the past ex-boxer, who is now pastor, he had badly beaten this other guy. <laughs> And suddenly the other guy remembers it. <laughs> and suddenly he's not drunk anymore. <laughs> he's, uh, he's running away down the mountainside. So they have peace after that. Either. So these are some of the uh, things. If you can make drunkenness seem foolish by telling your young people stories about how stupid drunk people act, then maybe they can say, I don't, I don't want to do that. I'm not going to get into that. Some people say, but I'm not going to get drunk. I'm social drinking. Drunkenness affects about 11%. Alcoholism affects about 11% of people who drink. About That means about 11 people who out of 11 people who drink socially, one becomes an alcoholic. And they are trapped and they can't get out. And they're addicted. If you had a dog that out of every people who come to your gate, the dog will bite one out of every 11 people who come to your gate. Would you keep that dog? No, one out of 11 is too much. I'm not going to, I'm not going to keep a dog that is that dangerous. So, no. <clears throat> Poem. One evening in October, when I was far from sober, drunk, okay, and struggling home alone in manly pride, my front feet began to flutter. This means he's crawling. 
okay? He can't walk properly. He's crawling home from the bar. My front feet began to flutter. So I lay down in the gutter, and a pig came by and parked right by my side. <laughs> so I hollered, it's great weather when two fine folk get together. And a lady passing by was heard to say, you can tell a man who boozes by the company he chooses. <laughs> Then the peak got up and slowly walked away. <laughs> <laughs> the pig said, I am too good to be associated with the drunkard. Okay, well, I, 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 <laughs> so that's um, some people, drunkards, and they, they uh, after they come to the Lord and they're drinking the spirit, of the Holy Spirit. So the book of Ephesians says, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. So sometimes you could go and you may want to go to a bar and pass out tracts, make a tract. And uh, the, they will say, what are you doing in here? And you say, I am advertising a drink which is better than what you are selling. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it's a, it's a Holy Spirit. Okay, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. If we, <clears throat> there was Aldous, Aldous Huxley, was a man who in the, in the early 20th century, 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, in there, he, somewhere in there, he was experimenting with drugs. But the problem is different drugs destroy different parts of your body. So he wrote an article and he said, wanted a new drug and he said, if we could have the positive effect of the drug, but no negative effect, we could have a high, and then the next morning, our liver is not hurt, like alcohol, and our, our lungs are not hurt, like tobacco, uh, our, our constitution, our health is not damaged, and our, we have no hangover, like uh, from, the, from the hangover, alcohol, I don't know you, we are, our, mint, our mind is fine, our body is fine. If we could have such a drug that would give us the high but no, 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 no uh, after effect, it seemed, he said, we would be living in a paradise. Everybody say, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Okay. Be not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. So that is the, that is the, the, the drink that we have. Well, that, and the next day, no hangover, and no, no health to our no damage to our body. So <clears throat> last year, Sister Lucky used to, uh, she would, and Sister Kalpana and Kancha, they are not here, but Lucky is here. So, and they would worship, and uh, they would jump, 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 and fall on the floor and everything. And uh, if some people, they worship, and they are still falling on the floor. Right, Brother Robert, from Miso Rum, some of the ladies are worshiping the Lord. And afterwards, some people even have to carry them away. But you see, and the next morning when they wake up, no headache. Okay, uh, filled with the joy of the Lord. What happens? So we have, just like the drunkard has to be carried home, but we uh, <laughs> we we may have to carry you home from the church meeting. But the next but the next morning, your your health will be fine, and you'll feel great. Okay, so that's we have a wonderful. Wonderful drink, the Holy Spirit. Now, the next thing, this next subject, alcohol we did. Tobacco. Okay. Now think about tobacco. Tobacco is a, is from the New World. Tobacco is a North American, the South American plant. Until the 1500s, tobacco was not known in Asia or Africa, it simply or Europe. It was not known because it was native plant to North America. So let's picture this situation. You have an officer in London. He is the officer for the East India Company. He is on the telephone. Of course, back then there was no telephone, 1600s, but he is on the telephone. And he is a right, he is calling to America, to London. There's a London guy in London. He's receiving the call from a man in America who wants to sell him different things. And he says, hello, East India Company. It says, uh, 
Oh, how are you? How are you? And so the, there's Walter Baby on the phone here. Hey, Walt Baby, how's it going? And then he tells his friend, hey, Marvin, come in, get on the other telephone. This crazy Walt is calling. So, yes, Walter, we are here. What do you What do you have? You have some new things you want to sell us, Walter? Well, what are they? Uh, let's see. Uh, tobacco. Well, what is tobacco? He said, it's a leaf. And uh, you just eat tons of it? Oh, no, no. Lots. You don't eat it. Lot, but other uses. Well, tell us some of the uses, Mr. Walter. <laughs> you push it up inside your nose and it makes you sneeze. Yeah, yeah, I think it would make you sneeze if you push it inside your nose. So, it's, um, no, I want, tell me some other uses, Walt. You set it on fire. You set it on fire? And you... And you and, you, you, and, and then you put it in your mouth. Oh, that's terrible. So you roll it up. You roll it up. And then you don't, don't tell me, Walter. You, you, you put it in your ear, right? No, no, no. You, in your mouth. Oh, I see. Okay. And then you, and then you set it on fire. Walter, I think you're going to have a hard time to persuade everybody that the answer to all of their problems is to put burning leaves in their mouth. So it's a... You try to think these people who smoke. Smoking, John Steinbeck said, John Steinbeck, who was an American writer, said that smoking simply doesn't taste very good. He said some other habits like drinking, he said there may be good taste, but smoking doesn't. He said, so why am I smoking? So he said, I will make a decision. I will stop smoking. And he said, but I can't make the decision for the rest of my life. I can't say I will not smoke for the rest of my life. I, I'm too weak to say that. But I said, I will make this decision. I will say, today I will not smoke. Only today I will not smoke. So he did not smoke that day. Then the next morning, he said, today I will not smoke. So that day also. Then he wrote an article about this. And he said, I have not smoked for 12 years. Simply each day I made the decision. Today, I will not smoke, and I haven't smoked for 12 years. So, if you have people who feel they are too weak and they cannot make that decision for their life, maybe they can do it one step at a time. Another idea I read in Reader's Digest, this one lady was on the bus, and one man was sitting on the bus, and every once in a while, he would run <coughs> thing out on the floor, a kind of motion like a man who was grinding a cigarette. And, but there was no cigarette. He was just, mm, he would go like that. So the lady who was sitting there, she turned and she said, what are you doing? <laughs> and he said, I am killing smoking. He said, every time I want to smoke, I do this, mm, I, like I'm killing the cigarette. And it kills the urge that I don't want to smoke anymore. And he said, when I started this, I was killing 20 imaginary cigarettes every day. I was doing this 20 times a day. Now I'm doing only 18. Well, that means the, the urge is coming down. So, And meanwhile, he's not smoking at all. He's just doing this and killing the urge, and the urge is slowly decreasing. So that's another idea. So alcohol. Now let's talk about the finance. Here's another way you can talk to people. Now, I want to ask you, anybody here, you used to be a drunkard? Anyone? Okay, Peter, Robert, okay. Uh, okay, let's, uh, Peter, Brother Peter says here, uh, when you were a drunkard before, how much did you drink? <coughs> we're, what we're trying to find here is the cost of the habit. How? One day in one day two. No, we're, we're, we're not talking about the price back then, we're talking about the uh, quantity that we use today's yeah, prices. Yeah, yeah. Uh, four bottles of rum. Four bottles of rum. Four bottles of rum per day. Yeah. Do you know how much, anybody know how much one bottle of rum costs today? Two hundred. Now. Two hundred. Two hundred. Two hundred. Two hundred. Two hundred. So that's four bottles per day. That's eight hundred rupees per day. Go on. Yes. Okay. Now, if you took 800, if you took four bottles of rum and you uncovered it and you emptied it into the wash basin or toilet, that would still be better than drinking it. 
<laughs> but if you emptied it into the wash basin, people would say, what, you paid 800 rupees and you're simply the point. But still it would be better than damaging your health. You lose your money, but at least you don't lose your health. But let's talk, if you do that every day, like that, 800 rupees per day times 365 days a year, and you have <laughs> Is it possible? <laughs> what? Oh, come on. You can't eat 800 rupees a day. That means you would be drinking three lakhs of rupees per year. Uh, Make three lakhs. <laughs> so, zero, zero, yeah, 40. Zero, zero, 48, zero, zero. Yeah. Is that math is correct? Yeah. So that if you drank 800 rupees per day, and you did that every day of the every day, you would drink three lakhs of rupees in one year. That's a lot of money to drink. Smoking. Anybody here used to, to smoke? Okay. Oh my goodness, half the class used to smoke. Now, okay, permit when you used to smoke, how much you used to smoke? Uh, 10 or 15. One packet? 10. One, one packet is how many? Is 10. 10. Okay. And one packet costs how much? 100. 100? Yeah. Okay, anybody else used to smoke more than, is this higher or lower than normal? Lower you used to smoke? Lower. I used to smoke 40 packs. Four. Oh. 40 packs. Four packs. Four. 40. 40. 40. 40. 40. 40 cigarettes. Yeah. 40 packs. 40 packs. packs. Yeah. Well, that's 400 cigarettes a day. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> one, one packet contains 20, okay? Then two packets daily. 40, 40, cigarette. cigarettes. 40 cigarettes. 40 cigarettes. Yeah. Four packs. So <laughs> if you're saying 100, that would be 400. <laughs> so anybody else? Uh, yeah. oh, this is approximately one pack, four packs, uh, other people. One per day. And anybody else on the drinking question, how many, anybody else who used to drink, uh, uh, he said four bottles of rum, anybody else, what did you used to drink? Five liters per day. Whole day and night, whole day and night. And the price is how much? <laughs> what, this costs how much? Five liters costs how much? Five hundred per day. Five hundred rupees per day. Per day. Well, his was eight hundred. Yours is five hundred. So That's if, 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 if eight hundred is three lakhs, then five hundred is going to be uh, more than one and a half lakhs. One point six lakhs. One point seven. Something like that. Okay. Smoking. He says one pack. He says four packs. So let's use two. Something in the middle. Two packs means two hundred rupees. So that's going to be one quarter of that. So that's three lakhs, and that's going to be one and a half. Is it something? If you are not asking to talk, keep silent. If you smoke, if you smoke two packs, if you smoke two hundred rupees, and that costs you three hundred sixty-five, you're going to spend. Like that. You're going to spend approximately 75, 73,000, 75,000 rupees. Now, if I took a 100 rupees, not 75,000, 100 rupee note, okay? If I took 100 rupee note and I put it out here and I set it on fire, I took the match and burned it in front of you. You would get your cell phones out, take a picture, and you if you did not have your cell phone here, what you would do is you would tell your family back home. You, Herbert would go to Tavalnad and he would say to his father, that crazy teacher burned money right in front of him. If he wants to burn money, why doesn't he give it to me? But that's only 100 rupees, not 75,000. And I'm not killing myself. I'm just only burning the money. Where these people, 
are paying the cigarette company to kill them. <laughs> please, I want to die. Kill me, please. Please, uh, those of, so they pay. I will give you money. I will pay you 75,000 rupees a year. Look, if you want somebody to kill you, you don't have to pay 75,000. You pay you, some gundas out here. You pay them a small amount. They will kill you much less expensively than this. And it will be less painful. They can kill you in five minutes with a gun, and then you can be dead like that. You give that guy 500 rupees. I'll give you 500 rupees, you kill me. Okay, fine. Okay, and uh, uh, so that's much less expensive than this and less painful too. The pain is terrible but short, then you're dead. Whereas this way, they kill you slowly. You're saying to the secret company, please kill me, but don't kill me quickly and painlessly. Kill me slowly and painfully. Make it as long and terrible as possible. Please, please kill me that way, so I will have maximum pain. Okay. And, uh, that's what the cigarette people and the alcohol people are doing. And alcohol, think of other damages, marriages that break up, cirrhosis of the liver, liver diseases, marriages, and so, so many, so much. And then wives who are left with nothing and have to, and they have no literacy, and they have no, uh, education and they are trying to raise the children and support the family at the same time. Why? Because of the husband's drinking. It caused all of this. It causes social damage, it causes damage to families, it causes damage to the to the so many different ways to the to the people. So it's a uh, alcohol is really a major problem. Then smoking did you know that second hand smoke Secondhand smoke means you are sitting in the restaurant or the bus or anywhere and the smoker smokes and then he exhales and you breathe that. That is secondhand smoke. And that is just as dangerous as the first hand smoke. That's why they're trying to make laws that you're not allowed to smoke. I go into restaurants and some places in Delhi they have tough rules and they say no smoking here. When I go to Darjeeling still they are allowing smoking in the restaurant. So I, when I go into the restaurant I ask them, I said, do you have any place that's not smoking section? They say, sorry, no. So I said, where are the smokers sitting? I will sit separate from them. And I said, I have no, dip. I don't want to get cancer. You know, where is your, your, uh, your, if your cancer department is that side of the <laughs> restaurant, then I will sit this side. <laughs> if there is a window, and the window is, the air is blowing, coming into the restaurant from the window, then I will sit there because the air will blow from me to them, so that the smoke will not come from them to me. This, it's really strange. I saw somebody here in Delhi. The air pollution is so bad in the city terrible. There was a newspaper article that said 10% of the population of the city will die of cancer if they do not solve this problem. So it's very, very now you, you, if you don't live in Delhi, I'm a permit and such, and you're going to have to go outside and get clean air sometimes on your vacation or all the daytime. Don't spend 365 days every year here. When a person stops smoking, you see, within three years after stopping smoking, their lungs are almost as good as someone who has never smoked. So if they will stop, now I'm not talking alcohol now or drug, I'm talking smoking only. If they will stop, they can recover, but they have to stop. Now the city, however, the air is so bad. I saw one guy on the motorcycle a few days ago, a couple of weeks ago. He is stopped by the side of the road, and he is lighting his cigarette. I'm thinking, why do you need to spend money on cigarette? If you want to smoke, just breathe the air. You drive behind the truck, the diesel truck, and you get free. Okay. <laughs> if that's what you want, you know, you don't have to pay any money for it. It's available. It's, all of us are smoking when we live in Delhi, uh, in that sense, because of the breathing this terrible air. And uh, so, so uh, why he is not satisfied with the pollution 
the, the, the diesel smoke and everything, he wants more. The, let me ask you guys when, who you used to smoke. The first time you smoked, just please, can you remember the first time you smoked? Didn't you cough at that? <laughs> it was not a natural thing. It was something you did to try to be cool, right? You tried to please your friends and you tried to be cool. But it was not a happy experience with that. <laughs> And uh, the first time you drank alcohol, some people drink to be accepted by other people. It's not because the, al the alcohol tastes like something died in it. <laughs> and uh, if you want grape juice, you can get grape juice, or you can eat grapes, or you can eat raisins. You don't have to drink wine to get the taste of the grape, of the fruit. You know, mango juice, apple juice, everything. Uh, apple wine, if apples are fine. You can eat apples, you can drink apple juice. You don't have to drink the wine in order to get the, 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 the flavor. And if you're seeking the alcohol, if the alcohol is what you want, then that, then you got a problem. But if you were wanting the taste without the alcohol, it's, it's, it's available. And, uh, uh, according to how much money you have, apples are cheap, apple juice is more expensive, but either way you get it. And uh, so that's alcohol and tobacco. Trying to use different ways. Now, you, when you think of how much money you are drinking and how much money you are burning up, you think, and maybe you're not spending three lakhs or one lakh in one year. But you think about how much it is, and you say, that's a lot of money that I am burning up. And maybe if I didn't smoke, I could spend it on something that's a little bit better than smoking. Or if I didn't drink, I could spend it on something that's a little bit better than drinking. So there's the foolishness of their behavior, the health damage to their body, the damage to their families, the damage to the society, that the poverty and death divorce that's caused by alcohol, the health damage to the society from the air pollution caused by smoking. So all of these are reasons not to do this. Good citizenship, uh, concern for the health. Now in the United Pentecostal Church, we say that if you drink and smoke, then we are not going to give you minister credential. Because, why? Because 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and chapter 6 talk about how your body is the temple of the Lord. And 1 Corinthians chapter 3 says, if you destroy this temple, God will destroy you. Anybody want to be destroyed by God? No, okay? So don't destroy the temple. So as an example to the saints, we say that ministers can't do this. Okay? No. Now, the reason we are against Gutka is the same reason that we are against tobacco. Why? Because gutka is flavored processed tobacco. Some packages of gutka says tobacco. Some packages do not say. But whether the package says it or does not say it, still that is what gutka is. Gutka is tobacco which has been processed and flavored. Why are they using tobacco? Because they want you to be a steady customer. If the nicotine, the addictive substance, is included, then you will buy again and again and again. And the price per piece may be low. One rupee, two rupees for one package of good. Is that right? So two rupees. But if you are buying one every day, then it starts to rise again. And that is only the financial, but beyond that is, of course, the health, which we have already talked about. So. Brother Supra told me that before he came to the Lord, he was eating these good cut things, about 50 of them per day. You know, just popping good cut packet, uh, he should, lots and lots and lots. Anybody here used to take good cut? No, before you used to take good cut? Before you? No, everybody was drinking and smoking, but not good cut. So, good cut, good cut is a substance, uh, is a. Uh, Harmful substance, it is tobacco, and that is why we're against it. Uh, people who chew pan, kaini, okay. 
The Westerners who come to India, they see the people spitting in the street, and they see the, they see the red splotches on the ground. It looks like blood. And they think, oh my God, what are these people doing? But here's the thing, the pond causes the red color, right? But the betel nut is the thing which is damaging to your, to, addictive to your health. The pond leaf is not addictive, but the beetle is the thing which causes the addiction. So the thing which causes the red is just disgusting. Your mouth looks like it's full of blood. That's, yeah, yeah. But, it's a, but the thing which is making you an addict and making you a prisoner of it, the substance is that beetle nut. So uh, this, is a, this is a thing that we have to, uh, this is why we are against it, especially the beetle nut, because it is, again, addictive. Paul said in the Bible, I will bring my body under control, under my rule. My body does not rule me. I rule my body. And I will bring my body under control so that after I have preached to other people, I myself will not be cast away. So in this case, this is another case in which you have to have self-control and control your appetites of your body so that that is un under control. So that's... Uh, the, the body is the temple of the Lord, and you are to keep your body under control, your, your appetites, your urges. Okay, concerning drugs, and now I'm speaking about illegal drugs. The people who, uh, the people who um, uh, go on the drugs, you know, they, 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 uh, they, they should not be outside in public if they are under the influence of drugs. Because a guy who is under drugs, even little things, he can't react properly to. He goes up to try to buy a hamburger at Wimpy's place over there. And he's standing there. He's on, the, he's on drugs. And he says, they put the burger in the bread! I can't deal with it! And the little things, they put the burger inside the bread. And I, I can't... I can't deal with it. I can't handle it. Such it's a simple thing. Like they put the meat inside the bread, and that he's thinking is such a weird, strange thing, because he's on drugs and he's overreacting to every little tiny thing. Have you ever seen people who have been taking a lot of drugs, and what their condition is? There's one guy I saw in Northeast City when I went to a conference one time. He seemed to be. He was really weird. You know. He had, he had dyed his hair blonde, yellow, and, <clears throat> and nobody in Northeast City has yellow hair. So why is he doing this? And he's wearing high-heeled shoes. His shoes, men, a guy, okay, he's wearing shoes that have these high heels. He seems to be very, because he's short, he's very self-conscious about that. But those two things are strange already, but in a top of that, the hair thing I wouldn't mind by itself so much, but it's a, but it's the feminism of wearing the high heels, plus the, his his wage, okay, like this. He seems like his health and his vigor has been sapped and has been pulled out of him. And they think, how does he become like this? Probably drugs, of some kind. He is doing. It is possible that it's a disease, but um, it happens sometimes with drugs like this. So it's, it's very sad what happens to people under drugs. Concerning some prescription drugs, Brother Ramleyana from Manipur was in this Bible school one time, and we were having church meeting right here, Sunday night Bible college service. This is before you were born. Okay? And uh, this is a... But he, he felt that there was one student who was absent, and that student said he was sick. So Brother Ramleyana went from this room off to room number three, because he was the senior uh, third year student, and he was the monitor for room number three. And this student was also staying in room number three. He went there, he said, I think, and he caught him in room number three, taking his, uh, so-called medication, which he did not need. It was recreational use of medication. So we had a prayer meeting for that 
student because this is recreational use of medica uh, prescription drugs is abuse of the substances. So the doctor may say, take two of these and, you know, two of these pills. But these guys, they're not sick. They're taking it lots and lots for the sake of the drug addiction. Okay. So he, we prayed for that guy because if we decided to give him another chance because, uh, but we prayed for him and today he's a stable member of, the, of his church in Manipur. But um, we, we really need to pay close attention, please, to doing everything we can in prayer, but also in preventative measures of teaching about the damage and laughing at the bad effect so that we will not want to do that. Your teenagers who are 13, 14, young kids and they are wanting to have adventure, show them this. And one last thing that you can think of, if you have a young person who is wanting to drink and experiment, if you see somebody who is a drunkard, say, is that what you want? Okay, is this what, is what you want? One father in, a, in England, he took, he, his son was trying to do some drugs. He told his son, he said he told a picture of the poet Coleridge, Samuel Taylor Coleridge. He showed a picture of him. He said, now look at that guy. This guy was a drug addict. He said, uh, opium, opium, if you take opium, he said, it has a binding effect on you and you cannot go to the bathroom properly. He said, this guy was a stranger to the bathroom. <laughs> he could not go to the bathroom properly. <laughs> if you see his picture, he looks like he is in that you know, condition. So um, he says, is that what you want? Last thing like that is, just if you if you go to the if you go to the if you have a son or daughter who wants to smoke, if you can do this, go to the uh, hospital. If the hospital people will allow you, take your son or your daughter to the place, the cancer department, and they will see people who some of them are smoking and they they have taken tobacco, chewing tobacco or something that they have cancer of the mouth and this is all destroyed and they can't use that, they have big sores on their mouth. And some of these people are so addicted to smoking that even after they cannot put the cigarette in their mouth, the operation has been made here to make a hole in their neck. And they are sitting there with a the cigarette to the hole in their neck. Okay, show this to your kids, you know, and say, is that what you want? And then there's the, the lip cancer and tongue and oral cancer, and now, and the black lungs. Now here in India, the cigarette boxes, they have a picture of their lungs. This is your lungs. You keep doing this. This is you, okay? This is what you want. And uh, if that picture is not enough for them, then you take them and show them the cancer department and they will be, I don't know, I don't know, no, 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 I don't want to ever be back in here as a patient. I, so if you scare them so that they said, I'm never going to do that. So then you may, you may give your kids a bad shock, but you may save their life that way. So I'm just trying to give you different ideas of how let's try the, 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 the people who are in jail because of drugs that they, uh, crimes they have committed in order to buy drugs. Those people, they already know the danger of drugs. They are in jail because of drugs. You don't have to tell them drugs are bad. They know this already. They just want freedom. They got, and you can preach to them. To them, you can preach the message of Jesus Christ directly. Jesus will free you. And you can have to give their life to Jesus. But sometimes young people, they don't know about all of that. They have not experienced all of that. So they think I can experiment and everything will be okay. And so they try. And uh, what you are trying, my, what I'm talking today is not so much ministering to the prisoners. I'm talking about ministering to the youth about not getting into drinking, smoking, taking drugs, illegal drugs, or prescription drugs, uh, uh, medication drugs as a recreational purpose.
And if we try to think of any possible way that we can show them not to do this. You saw the video of the prostitute in order to buy drugs. She's a prostitute. Then she gets her drugs and she's doing that. If you can have, if you find a video like that and you show this to your young people, is that what you want for your life? No. Okay. Don't get into drugs. That's it.